Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A San Antonio teenager convicted of murdering another teen two years ago could soon be let out of jail after serving just 11 months of his 25 year sentence. And the mother of the victim, Sebastian Vasquez Carpio, is hoping a judge stops that from happening. Erica Hernandez tells us why this mother is asking for help ahead of tomorrow's hearing. It's been two years this month when Sebastian Vasquez Carpio's body was found inside a burnt out car in West Bear County. The 17 year old was killed by another teen who we aren't identifying since he has yet to be ruled an adult. He was sentenced to 20 years on a manslaughter charge and 25 years for aggravated robbery, a sentence that didn't sit well with Sebastian's mother, Ana Maria Carpio. The justice system initially took um, felt my son, felt myself, felt my family in providing justice for what was done to my son. She will return to the courtroom as her son's killer is about to age out of the Texas juvenile system. A hearing will take place to determine whether he will serve the rest of his sentence on parole or be transferred to adult prison. He has only served or has only been in the rehabilitation uh, facility for 11 months. And I feel that 11 months is not sufficient. Carpio is now reaching out to the community for help and support. So on my post, I indicated um, that if they could provide support and write a statement to be submitted to the state. Those statements will be reviewed by the court before a decision is made. I believe in rehabilitation. One is deserving of it. I feel this individual does not deserve to get a second opportunity. That transfer release hearing will be taking place tomorrow morning, and we will be there at that hearing and have more on the ruling on this case. Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. Happening right now, the Uvalde City Council is meeting, and part of that discussion this evening includes a report from the Uvalde Police Chief. According to the council agenda, Chief Daniel Rodriguez will deliver a report on establishing a physical fitness program for the Uvalde Police Department. In past city council meetings, community members have questioned the physical readiness of officers on the force and have asked for stricter requirements. Also tonight, council will consider a request from UPD to accept a donation for a total communication center remodel. We're following what's happening at that meeting right now and we'll have an update on the night beat. The third time was not the charm. City Council remained stalled after yet another discussion today on how it wants to spend $50 million in extra money coming in from CPS Energy. And with the vote on next year's budget just two days away, City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us the council might. Garrett, where's the division in all this? It split almost right down the middle of the 11 member city council, but it appears right now to be leaning against city staff plans for a rebate. Now, half it, with roughly half of the council thinking that's not the best way to spend the money. Now, city staff have continued to push a plan to send that money back to CPS customers, mostly in the form of direct bill credits worth about $29 to the average resident. Though some of the largest businesses could get back rebates more than $90,000 worth. Much of the argument on this has been over whether the money could be better put to use to helping prepare for future extreme weather through home weatherization programs, for example, and if the bill credits will really help the people who need it most. You know, after we have the next brutal summer or the next tough winter, I'm not going to be able to look my constituents in the eyes and say, well, I gave you 26 bucks back, but sorry I didn't do anything to really protect you against these future bills. The residents that I represent appreciate 26, 29, $32. Whatever it is, is going to help them. We did hear a few council members bring up putting a pause on this until after they passed the rest of the budget. However, Mayor Ron Nuremberg had told KSAT he expects the rebate plan to be passed because unless council acts on Thursday to change or remove staff's original plan, the rebates would be included in the budget. Now, it's far from the only issue still up in the air. City council members have proposed more than three dozen amendments that would cost almost $48 million over the course of two years. And they still need to figure out where all of those are going to land. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News.
All right, thank you, Garrett. And in our next half hour, we'll be talking with Mayor Ron Nirenberg about the budget, about the, these potential CPS energy rebates, and a whole lot more in our KSAT Q&A. Meanwhile, acts of intimidation and the blackballing of deputies. Day two of sentencing for Michelle Barrientes Vela included hours of damaging testimony detailing how she abused her office. Dylan Collier explores the possible impact. If the state has any hope of a judge sending disgraced ex-constable Michelle Barrientes Vela to prison at the conclusion of her sentencing, they need to establish a clear pattern of abuse of power. Tuesday, they went a long way to doing that. Precinct 2 Corporal Vanessa Pena told the court she and other deputies were called by Barrientes Vela to respond to this West Side family dollar in early February 2019. The then constable so distressed on the radio that her deputies thought it was an officer in trouble call. We get into something, you can hear the change in our voices and her voice, you can tell something was wrong. But once on scene, deputies realized it was nothing of the sort. Barrientes Vela's adult son had been accused of shoplifting and the then elected public official was interrogating the store's manager about it. One of the first times I had seen her upset. Other personnel described being ordered to destroy records at the end of Barrientes Vela's tenure and being told to freeze out deputies Leonicio Moreno and Christopher de la Cerda or otherwise face consequences. The way she said it was actually a direct threat to me. Sentencing will now pause for three weeks and resume on October 4th due to scheduling conflicts in the court. The state is about halfway through its witness list. Reporting downtown, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. The Hollywood Park Police hope they're one step closer to finding the suspect accused in a deadly shooting inside a restaurant. They now know the man's name. They're looking for 22-year-old Derek Oliver Jr. in connection with the triple shooting. Three people shot, two of them died. 26-year-old Justin Hutchison and 27-year-old Elena Henderson. That shooting happened Sunday morning around 1 a.m. outside the Rose Bistro restaurant on San Pedro Avenue, not far from Mecca Drive. Investigators say it started with an argument when Oliver pulled out a gun. Police say Hutchison was shot in the face and died at the scene. Henderson was a bystander, the third victim wounded but survived. Anyone with information on the suspect's whereabouts asked to call police at 210 335 6,000. We also now know the name of a victim shot in the back of the head while in his own car on Sunday. It is 21 year old Luis Garza. According to Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, the shooting happened on Latigo Drive near Rawhide. When San Antonio police arrived, they found one victim shot on the passenger side of a vehicle. That victim was trying to help Garza, who was his brother. Police saw a blood trail from the back driver's seat. Police are still looking for the suspect. Seguin police have arrested five suspects accused in a carjacking and assault of a 15 year old outside of a Walmart. Those suspects are between 16 and 19 years old, all charged with aggravated robbery. This happened at the Walmart on the South State Highway 123 bypass. It was back on September 5th. Police say one suspect forced the victim and his 16 year old passenger out of the car. They allegedly assaulted the teen before then taking off in his Dodge Charger. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center celebrating after hitting a one year milestone for their blood emergency readiness program. We first told you about the story yesterday. It's a nationwide partnership to ensure there's enough blood for emergencies like mass shootings. Alicia Barrera spoke with the organization about the importance of communities joining forces. A year ago, seven blood centers across the nation, including South Texas Blood and Tissue, started the Blood Emergency Readiness Corps, or BERT. Each one of them is able to set aside on their rotation week that they can set aside 10 of the o, pos o positive units and four O negative units. The blood centers participate in the rotation to help keep the supply steady and stable. This in response to the changing of the times. As we're seeing, you know, more of the mass casualty events, mass trauma events, unfortunate, you know, things such as the, you know, uh, shooters on the loose, so the mass shooting incidents. Since its start, Burke has grown to 33 blood centers in 41 states responding to shootings, but also natural disasters. In Memphis, September of last year, uh, we did have a response where the Burke, uh, the Blood Emergency Readiness Corps, was activated to help the victims there. Oxford, Michigan, last December was also another incident. 
The one that hits close to home, of course, uh, is the Uvalde uh, school shooting last May. It can be the difference between life and death when demand is high and blood supply remains low. And right now, a lot of help is still needed. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center lists their blood supply level as high risk, which means that if today they stop taking donations, they would only have enough supply for the next two days to respond to any type of emergency. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam. It's a beautiful day out there. We got some clouds out there as well. And I'm not laughing because the clouds are funny, but Adam Kasky's dancing. He was doing a happy dance. Oh, uh, you call me out, do you? Call me out. It was, it was hard to ignore. I'm sorry. It was yeah. one of these. I was trying to throw them <laughs> off behind the camera. I was trying to do that. Kind of worked. Okay, whatever. Anyway, take a look at the radar. We've got some heavy rain on the south side of Gonzales County and even stretching into Wilson County. This is the best shower activity that we have out there. A few other little showers elsewhere we'll take a look at in a little bit. But you look at this one, and this has actually formed a little bit of a line that's heading to the southwest at about 15 miles per hour. So we can time this out for a few folks, see what kind of communities would be just down the path of this or downstream. And you're looking at Yoakum at about 614, Stockdale at about 634, and Harmony at about 705. We'll be back to talk more about radar and update on the tropics in just a bit. Thank you, Adam for the weather, not the dance so much, but more young voters. That's the goal behind the latest focus of Move Texas, how they're finding new ways to reach out to college age voters. And voting at schools is done for the convenience of voters, but some argue it's a safety risk for students. What a San Antonio school district is joining others in doing to try to create a solution. And let's check out downtown 37 and Jones, and you can see traffic is really slow going there, especially in the northbound lanes of I-37 and Jones. But traffic heavy in both directions. I think that's I-37 where it gets on, heads towards I-10 and I-35 where the slowdown is, that exit ramp. We'll be right back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. A, chair, a church daycare van was stolen, vandalized, and abandoned. The community effort to meet the daycare's needs for now and why finding a replacement could be a challenge. Plus, it's not just you. Yes, it's been a record breaking year for water main breaks in San Antonio. Why Saw says that some of those mains are going weeks without getting fixed. We'll have those stories for you and a lot more tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. We'll see you at 10. Well, Election Day polling locations are chosen for accessibility. Many times they're at schools. But given the recent shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, accessibility is putting parents and students and teachers on edge. Our Courtney Friedman explains how a vote last night by Northeast ISD's board aims to keep students and staff safe. Our eight year old has already done training for active shooter and for fire drills and all of the other normal things this year. Normal for these times, a hard reality for any ISD parent, Tina Stolhansky. A few months ago, parents and staff began talking to the board about election day when many schools become polling locations. Having all those people on camp, extra people on campus is always a concern. Debbie Weissmuller is a parent of two NEISD students and the district's PTA president. Both she and Stolhansky were thrilled that the NEISD board voted last night to make election day a holiday for both students and staff. And it also, though, helped helps twofold um, with the teachers and the administrators having that opportunity to vote. Right now, we are really, really practicing safety at our campuses. And with that means every single door is locked. And if we have elections taking place at our campuses, that isn't possible. Polling locations are not final yet, but NEISD Communications Director Aubrey Chancellor confirms the latest proposal shows the district with 40 locations, the majority at elementary schools. The move may cause inconvenience for working parents like Stolhansky, but she says it's worth it. I choose my child and staff safety over the inconvenience of providing child care for that day. Northside ISD just approved the same election day holiday a month ago, but just for students. Judson ISD's board will vote on the possible holiday this Thursday. And today we confirm that SAISD, South San ISD and Edgewood ISD will not be changing their holiday schedules. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. 
Sky 12 over another location off the voting site. The library downtown. A lot of places are. But today, it's just a pretty view out there. Yeah. That it's a, big red building. It's, we a, all know. it's a great looking <laughs> building. Enchilada red. That's right. <laughs> the color. Some construction going along around there, too. But, you know, all in all, not a bad day. I mean, it. it have we put the 100s behind us? Are we not going to get a record? Are you prepared to say that now, Adam? I was thinking about that while driving today. It's on my mind a lot, yeah. and yeah. I am prepared very soon to just say it's not going to happen. Soon, not yet. Not yet. There's still okay. a chance. All right. But let's talk about rainfall now. We have a few areas of rain out there. We talked about this moving from Gonzales County into Wilson and now even to Northeast Carnes County and just clipping parts of DeWitt County. This is pushing to the southeast and really the most substantial shower that we have out there. You can see some lightning associated with it as well. Those are the white lines that you see. That's those are the cloud to ground actual lightning strikes out there. And it is electrified and it's starting to take this turn a little westward. Uh, closer to trajectory toward basically Floresville and Poth. And it's right along 87 right now. You zoom in in Stockdale. It's just off to the west of you. It's between Smiley and Stockdale. Smiley looks like he just got a quick hit of rain there. And Sutherland Springs, most of this, if not all of it, should miss you. But we are watching this outflow boundary that's been moving westward through Seguin, Guadalupe County, and now into west or eastern Bear County. And sometimes these outflow boundaries can generate a new shower or storm. We'll cross our fingers here around San Antonio. I just don't think the odds are really too high of that actually happening. I think it's a possibility and not a probability. And what we had in western Medina County coming to an end, you look in Bandera County, city of Bandera, and between Pipe Creek and Bandera, a little downpour here, actual City of Bandera, Cowboy Capital here, actually got hit by the downpour very briefly, hit Bandera High School. As for rainfall accumulations with this, so far what we're reading here on the radar is actually not too bad. We're talking about a half an inch or more from this downpour right here on the east side of Bandera, about 0.7 inches. Right, you look a little farther to the east, 0.7 inches, but then lesser amounts as you get closer to Pipe Creek. So that's what we have out there right now. Again, not a whole lot, but this is basically that 10 to 20% we've been talking about. And we could really see this kind of activity pop up just about any day over the next seven days. I just think it's less likely as we get into tomorrow because of some drier air above us that's going to move in. So that 10 to 20% chance basically over the next seven days, just again, not as much into tomorrow. Here's a bigger picture. Parts of West Texas seen some more good rainfall. They've put a big dent in their drought as well. Well, a good portion of the state has, but it's nice to see it in West Texas and the monsoon rain still in the four quarters and parts of the Western US. This is all Pacific moisture being funneled in between the upper level low over Washington and the upper level high over the central plains. And it's just pushing that moisture in and squeezing it out of the clouds. But we're not going to have any major feature like that bringing us widespread or soaking rain within the foreseeable future here. Touching on the tropics quickly, just a 10% chance of development with this wave that we've been watching. That's really just moved off of the African coastline, but a 40% chance of this little ripple in the flow, this disturbance that's headed toward the Caribbean over the next five days, that's got that 40% chance. So far, a quiet Atlantic hurricane season. And remember the average peak of hurricane season is September 10th. So we're starting to get on the back side of that now. 93 are high today. That's two degrees above average. The record 100 set back in 1912. Yeah, when the record is 100, you know it's getting harder and harder to attain that temperature. We talked about the rain out west. Alpine at 62 right now. Talk about rain cool there. El Paso 86, even 74 in Fredericksburg at the moment. 93 New Braunfels, 84 in Gonzales. We had some rain cool there there, and the outflow is now pushing westward. So you may get a brief little breeze here, Converse area up towards Cibolo and Universal City. But temperatures for the most part, low 90s right now. 87 at 8 o'clock with the showers ending after sunset. 10 o'clock, 83 degrees. You'll notice the stickiness tonight and throughout the day tomorrow. 73 in the morning, 87 at noon. Then about 93, I think, for the high temperature in the afternoon. So Hondo about 92, Canyon Lake 93, along with Seguin and Bulverde at 90. 
High temperatures not changing much. Low to mid 90s basically for the foreseeable future and no big fronts anytime soon. We typically see our first 10 degree drop from a cold front in late September. Mm, OK, so that 100 getting a little more elusive. Yes. yes, he's prepared very soon to talk about that. Yeah, very soon. All right, so UTSA heads to UT Austin. There, it seems like both teams are locked in on this game. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, after the Alabama game, there was hope that, you know, they could recover quickly from some of the injuries, and they were hoping they'd get out of that unscathed. That's not the case. They're down their top two quarterbacks. So what are the UTSA Roadrunners ready for from UT now that they may be down to their third-string quarterback? And UTSA has UT's attention coming up. UTSA Roadrunners will face their toughest test of the season when they travel to Austin this Saturday to face the number 21 Texas Longhorns in their first ever meeting in team's history. The Roadrunners are coming off the 41-38 overtime victory against Army on the road to improve to 1-1 after their triple overtime 37-35 season opening loss at home against number 24 Houston at the time. Back-to-back -back overtime games. The Roadrunners will be 13.5 point underdogs when they visit Royal Memorial Stadium. Coach Sarkeesian is a very good football coach. He will take whatever he's got and he'll use it. It'll be a very well designed scheme. And uh, they're, they're a really hard outfit uh, to stop. They've got one of the best play callers in the country, one of the best play designers, and they have some of the best players in the country. Therefore, you get to go battle the number one team in the country to, you know, I would say they outplayed them on that day. It's going to be a crazy atmosphere. We know it's going to be a lot of people. It's going to be very loud. It's going to be rocking. Um, but poison the noise, and I think we're going to be ready for that. I like that, poison the noise. After winning Conference USA Offensive Player of the Week for the second straight week, Harris has also been named the Earl Campbell. Tyler Rose Award National Player of the Week after posting his second straight 300-plus yard performance. Meantime, the Texas Longhorns go forward with what appears to be a new starting quarterback in redshirt freshman Charles Wright with both Quinn Hewers with an SC sprain in his left clavicle and Hudson Card, a sore ankle, recovering from the injuries in the 20-19 loss to then number one ranked Alabama. Wright has only played in one game, and that was Longhorns 70-35 blood of Texas Tech last season. As a result, Roadrunners are prepared for Roshan Johnson to run the Wildcat a lot more in this game. We got a, a great deal of respect for UTSA. I, I can't speak for the other schools that, that stub their toes in those ball games. You know, uh, you turn on the tape of UTSA, they get your attention quickly um, with their schemes, with their with their personnel, and the way they play the game. Um, you know, clearly they had a lot of success last season, um, and then they've had two really hard-fought games here to start the year. Um, you know, gut-wrenching loss to Houston, and then turn around with a with a with a great win versus Army, which is tough to. Do against the triple option uh, so they have our attention you know that that didn't take long this morning when we turned the tape on for them there you know they get your attention we need to be ready to go and right, kickoff between UTSA and Texas on Saturday set for 7 p.m. and KSAT 12 sports will be there the 24th ranked fighting Texas Aggies will still be five and a half point favorites when they host number 13 Miami at Kyle Field on Saturday night that despite the fact they're coming into this game after a shocking upset loss 17 14 to Appalachian State last Saturday in College Station. Maybe one reason why the Aggies are still favorites is the fact that Miami hasn't defeated an SEC team on the road since 2013 since they won 21 16 at Florida. But while the Aggies continue to evaluate Haynes King as their starting quarterback after his less than stellar performance against the Mountaineers head coach Jimbo Fisher was asked if he would relinquish play calling duties during the game. In time, I would. Yeah, possibly could. I mean, there's you always evaluate those things. And everything we do, evaluate everything we do. And it is a, it's a conglomerate of play calling, too. I mean, we're getting information from everybody and thoughts and the ideas that we put down in those calls and what we do going in the game on our sheets is it's a, collect, it's a collective group decisions based off our offensive staff and what we do and how we do things. But yes, possibly yes. All right, kickoff between number 13 Miami against number 24 Texas A&M will be at 8 p.m. in College Station on Saturday night. I like, expect the Aggies to bounce back. I do, too. Yeah. <laughs> I do, too. I think they'll fix whatever was broken and get back into it. But they got to do it quick. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back. The San Antonio City Council just a few days away from voting on a large budget for the city's next fiscal year. So to talk about that and what it means for you, we've got San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg joining us for the KSAT Q&A. Mayor, always good to see you. We've talked so much with this budget about the idea of getting money back from CPS Energy because of a surplus from CPS. 
that goes back to the city. This idea of rebates that we touched on earlier in this show, roughly 30 bucks for the average customer. Where yeah. does that stand now? And I'm, I'm going to throw a two parter at you here. So where does that stand now? But also, has there been another alternative really fleshed out so that when this vote happens, Council members are voting on whether to give back money to customers or another very specific plan B. Yeah, and let me first start by saying again, this is not surplus revenues at CPS. This is uh, a result of the 14 percent dividend that the city receives as as CPS revenues come in as the city's as the CPS owner the city receives 14% of revenue. So as the, the gas prices and high electric bills went up, there was more revenue into the city, and in this case, excess revenues. And so the city managers proposed a rebate going back to CPS customers, everybody. Uh, depending on how much uh, they spent, they'll get uh, a portion of that back in the form of a one-time bill credit. I think that there is consensus beginning to form around the the idea that we need to do that. I believe very strongly that uh, customers uh, deserve some relief as a result of these high bills, and I think there's consensus of forming around that. To your question about has there been any alternatives put forward, uh, there have been alternatives put forward, and I would again uh, suggest that the alternatives that have been articulated are things that we're already doing from tree canopy to heat island mitigation to building of resilience centers uh, and weatherization. These are things that are funded. And if there is a demand for more capacity in each of those programs, the case has to be made first before we go and spend that money. In the meantime, people need relief. And I look forward to delivering that on Thursday. Um, and, and again, just to keep in mind a perspective, this is roughly one and a half percent of the city's budget. It's a three point five billion dollar budget. And there's been a lot of oxygen spent on these last 50 million dollars, roughly forty two and a half when it comes to the rebate that will go back to CPS customers. But it's important, I think, that where we can provide relief that we do so. And I want to talk about some of those other things that are in the budget in a second. But I, I, my final question on the CPS energy and the the money uh, that the council's deciding on, will this have any impact on future rate increases? I know that there was just a, a rate increase that was passed earlier this year. When you see that there's this this much, you know, that could go back potentially to customers, is does this impact future rate hikes? Does it show that the that CPS doesn't need future rate hikes? I mean, does it have any impact? Well, it doesn't because, again, this is not money into CPS coffers. This is not a surplus at CPS. This is money that's as a result of high gas prices that CPS has to pay itself. But because their revenues received off of the bills to recoup those costs, the 14 percent dividend that goes back to the city has also gone up. And so that's the part that needs to be, I think, considered for uh, relief for customers. Um, the high energy costs, the high gas prices that are, are a result of a lot of different global factors and inflation, those will fluctuate. But CPS also bears those as expenses in order to generate the electricity that people use in their homes and that businesses use in their processes. So this is a little bit different um, as it relates to going forward. CPS is a is a cost of service business. They should only be charging what it costs to maintain the infrastructure and to produce the electricity. And that's exactly what uh, they will do going forward, as they have done for uh, the 75 years that they've existed as a city owned utility. We'll see what happens with that vote uh, here in the next coming days. Let's talk about some of the other things in that budget. Police and fire always make up a really significant portion of that and a big focus, rightly so. Yes. Uh, with the increase in awareness, in the need for mental health services, there's something built in here uh, when it comes to, to calling 911, looking for someone perhaps not to respond to any kind of crime, but to respond to a mental health concern. What's being looked at there with this budget? I'm glad you asked, Myra, because you might remember that over the last two years, uh, police departments all around the country have been examining how they can do things better. And, and public safety is the number one job of the city government. And during, those during that process where we had a lot of town hall meetings, a lot of 
experts uh, come and talk to us about different different ways that we can augment public safety. One of the things that came out of the result was how we can augment dispatch services to ensure that if there are mental health calls, that we have the right folks answering those calls. And so part of a national effort to ensure that there is uh, mental health emergency line access, as well as locally that we ensure that we have those experts on the line if there is an emergency call for mental health, we're adding those services into dispatch. I would also add that you know we, we are adding a significant number of uniform positions within the police department, the largest number that I've ever had or, or that I've ever seen since I've been here in City Hall, uh, as well as two units for the fire department, uh, a ladder unit and an EMS unit. So a big part of this year's budget that unfortunately has been overshadowed by a lot of the conversation we just had has been how we are boosting public safety for our community. Um, that goes in line with a lot of other things that we're doing to come back to pre-pandemic levels with regard to infrastructure, maintenance, streets, sidewalks, drainage, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this budget to deliver the basic services that our residents expect. Like you said, it's a lot more than just the CPS rebate that's been right. ba ballied back and forth. And, and, and tax relief as well, a whole suite of tax relief, including a tax rate rollback, homestead increases, et cetera. So the CPS rebate is coupled with a number of di different things that we're trying to do to provide relief uh, to residents here in San Antonio. All right, Mayor Ron Nirenberg will be following this vote on Friday. And of course, we'll be breaking down what was approved uh, when the time comes. Thanks for being here this evening. Thanks, y'all. Have a great night. Have a good one. We'll be right back. A sign inflation might be slowing down. The Consumer Price Index numbers released today show a decline from high, historically high inflation. Inflation falling to about 8.3 percent compared to a year ago, which is still a very high level, but lower than previously reported numbers. This is in part because of steady fall of gas and oil prices. The national average for regular gasoline, now $3.70 a gallon, down 10.6% compared to a month ago. The Federal Reserve is still expected to raise interest rates by 0.75, three quarters of a per percentage point at its next meeting. An announcement on that is expected next week. The Food and Drug Administration will discuss making over-the-counter birth control available. They have a meeting scheduled in November. This move comes months after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. That ruling allowed abortions. They overturned that ruling. Since several trigger laws have been in place, the meeting would review the pill from pharmaceutical company Perigo. It has been available for sale with a prescription since 1973. That meeting is set for November 18th. Now, just a little bit of action on the radar. A pretty picture here, that's for sure. Adam Cassie's going to be talking about whether we've got any more chances for some rain in the forecast coming up. To the buzz now and yesterday, television's biggest night, the 74th Primetime Emmy Awards. As usual, there were some expected winners, a few surprises. Some of the night's biggest ovations went to Abbott Elementary. The show's creator, writer, and star, Quinta Brunson actually won a writing Emmy. And supporting actress and a comedy winner Cheryl Lee Ralph stopped the show, drawing standing ovations when she won, when she sang, and when she spoke. She's uh, a great singer. I yeah, don't know if you heard that. That was but, really awesome. Yeah. They say everything is bigger in Texas, and that seems to apply to even the wildlife. Tim Doramus is used to gathering up gators, catching eight in the last month. But this nearly 11 foot reptile even caught him off guard. Our sister station in Houston, KPRC, reports that he was called in by Fort Bend County officials with a referral from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Look how big that alligator is. It's massive. Duramus expertly harnessed the wayward intruder with the aid of a tow truck, said, See you later, alligator, uh -huh. as they hauled him away. <laughs> all right, it is a day to celebrate one of the most versatile nuts of them all, the peanut. Today is Adam Kasky. Say it with me. National, National Peanut National Day. Day. Uh, now we kind of tricked wah. you there, I guess, because yeah. peanuts aren't actually a nut. They're legumes. They fall in the same family as peas and beans. What? I know. Did you know? See the things you learn on National Peanut Day. And they grow underground like potatoes. They weren't popular as a food until the South's cotton crop was decimated by pests in the early 20th century. Yeah, Dr. George Washington Carver, a black scientist and inventor, was researching peanuts, encouraged farmers to grow them. 
Embrace the peanut. Mm -hmm. Come out of your shell. Uh. <laughs> oh, don't be so salty, Myra. Oh, hey. Good one. Oh. There we go. I like and she just it. got roasted. <laughs> nice. Okay, that was that was Thank really you. good. Thank right. you. That, that was really good. Yeah. All right, now, all now, right. let's now talk about the weather now. See what these days do for right. us? Right, now he's got to butter you up, make up for all this. Okay. Yeah. Moving on to the radar. Get it. Yeah, we're moving on to the radar. Now. Okay, Trust let's me. please. <laughs> yeah. 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 Last little there. bit of rain right along 87 here, Wilson County. I mean, we're talking Stockdale over towards Smiley, now just south of Smiley, as we talked about before. Uh, and along it south of Highway 87, it's that last little bit of rain that's left over. Outflow boundary moving into Floresville, Poth area. You'll get a quick wind gust up to about 20, 25 miles per hour. And we could have have one or two showers develop along this, but it's I, I really don't think it's going to happen, to be honest with you. It is a very well defined and pronounced outflow boundary. So this is the wind that gets puffed out of the thunderstorms, hits the ground and goes traveling sideways and it picks up uh, insects usually. And with the rainfall that we've had, you may have noticed a little increase in insects outside. And so I think that's largely what the radar is detecting. It doesn't detect the wind. It detects the movement of what's in the wind. And in this case, this outflow boundary is picking up uh, insects as it moves westward. And I was looking at it and as this outflow boundary hits your neighborhood, I mean, it's moving into shirts right now, that outflow boundary, uh, it'll give you a wind gust up to about 25 miles per hour and uh, it'll drop your temperature maybe five or six degrees. So that's outflow boundary. It's headed east and you look at its distance from, say, Windcrest, well, it's only about seven miles away, so it's probably about 15, 20 minutes away from Windcrest. So, that, you know, outflow boundary, it stretches from Elmendorf basically all the way up to Canyon Lake, and it's pushing westward. Elsewhere, a few lingering showers out there, but not a whole lot to speak of. We're talking southwestern Bandera County, not far from Vanderpool and Utopia, but not hitting those communities. And here and there in parts of Kirk County, we've had a few pop-up showers, but that's it. You see the activity um, that was down in Gonzales County and dropped over an inch of rain estimated by the Doppler radar. And here's where we saw rainfall today, looking at the 12 hour totals where you see the blues and greens. That's where we had a few showers green indicating over half an inch and the darker green even um, over an inch. OK, so let's talk about our rainfall so far this month. We've had just over under an inch officially at the airport, and that's about eight tenths of an inch below average since January 1st, 8.2 inches, and that's over 14 inches below average. I mean, it's been nice the past several weeks and we've put a big dent in our drought, but we're still way behind and in our reservoirs could use it as well. Uh, Medina, for example, Medina Lake, only 8% capacity right now, 8% full, I should say. Big picture, visible satellite imagery, not much popping up around here. Just a few of those storms we had earlier. Main action is in the four corners and over the inner mountain west, but not in our neck of the woods. Now we could have more of this pretty much every day over the next seven days, about a 10 to 20% chance here and there every afternoon. And I think even slightly higher odds, the closer you are to the Gulf coastline, as is often the case in the kind of weather pattern we're getting into. 91 right now, dew point is 63, south southeasterly wind at a steady 10 miles per hour. Feels like it's one degree warmer than the air temperature because of these dew points. Port SA, Kelly Field area, 65 degree dew point. Gonzales, 71, along with Ple Pleasanton. We're feeling the stickiness out there. Not as much of a break from the humidity as what we had yesterday. And tomorrow, we'll have the dew points in the low 70s in the morning, so very humid, then just a little drop into the 60s by the afternoon. Right now, 85 in Kerrville, 89 in Pleasanton, 91 officially at the airport, Holotus at 89 degrees. We'll see temperatures falling through the 80s, showers ending after sunset. Tomorrow we start the day at 73. By the afternoon, we make it up to about 93 for the high temperature. So similar to what we had out there earlier today. No temperature changes really over the next seven days. Okay, thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Tuesday the 13th. Ex-Constable Michelle Barrientos Vela continued during do, day two of her sentencing. She was described as a chaotic leader who served herself 
above others. The state continues to build a pretty strong case that Michelle Barrientes Vela operated with a bully mentality. The ex-constable faces between two years probation and 10 years in prison after being convicted of tampering with records. A lineup of Precinct 2 deputies, both current and former, took the stand throughout the day detailing odd behavior from the former county leader. The sentencing hearing will resume in early October. There's a three-week pause due to scheduling conflicts in the court. The state at this point is about halfway in calling its witnesses through its witness list. Some good news for those of us sick of those high gas prices. It is getting a little cheaper to fill up. The national average for a gallon of gasoline is $3.71, down seven cents over the past week. The lowest it's been since the beginning of March. We are seeing lower prices because the cost of oil is lower now and gas prices usually just follow suit. Well, a lot of people sent in pictures of some of those streaks in the sky and uh, had questions about it. Uh, that is is the uh, Starlink satellite. So we see these from time to time. What happens is, uh, this is from SpaceX, by the way, these things uh, get launched. And it's about two days after launch that you start to you start to see them in the sky. They reflect some of the light and it looks like a line because we're talking uh, about 50 satellites here in a row. And this is gonna provide internet to play rural places across, uh, across the world.